Amen. Thank you, choir. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Mark, the very first book in our New Testament, Mark chapter number 22. Mark chapter 22. And I want to share with you today about the tragedy of saying no to Jesus Christ. The tragedy of saying no to Jesus Christ. A number of years ago, there was a guy by the name of Clint Westcock. He was a uh, He's a man who just went missing. His family didn't know where he went. No one could find him. And he was just, all of a sudden, uh, uh, he was just gone. Uh, he wound up to be a homeless man uh, who, had, uh, uh, who uh, just lived in the streets. Uh, he had to beg and steal and borrow uh, whatever he could to get through life. Well, it was discovered that after his property, that he had a home and all that, uh, when his property was sold, there was an excess of almost $25,000, which back in that day uh, was an extra large sum of money. It's a large sum today. <clears throat> so in that day, it was an extra large sum of money. And so they had to run an ad in the paper, the state attorney uh, had to run a foreclosure of property and all that in the paper and give the assets and all that stuff. And so they had such a desire, they wanted to find this guy. And so they asked the newspaper to run it, said, do you have uh, perhaps journalists or reporters that, that could maybe track this guy down somewhere because this is a lot of money, especially for that day, uh, that's his. But he doesn't know, he's, he doesn't know it. He doesn't know that, that he has that money. And so two of the reporters actually tracked this guy down in another city they found him on a street. And when they addressed themselves of why they were there and who they were, he said, my life is okay. My life is okay. I'm not interested in, uh, I'm not interested in none of that. And they said, don't you see that you have a, a large amount of money, but you have to go back and you can go with us and you have to go back and, and to claim that money. And he would never do that. He just said, no, I am not ready for that yet. You know, I have found out through the years, after you explain the, the glories of heaven, what God has prepared for us who trust in Him, who follow Him, when we see that we have the promise of God's presence with us every day when we are born into the family of God, but yet there are many today, after you explain that to them and to know that uh, what we have waiting for us at the end of the way for all of us who, uh, who are believers who have received Christ, but yet for some reason they say no, they refuse that today. I've never understood that, but that's what we're going to see in our story today from Matthew chapter 22. Uh, Jesus is going to give a parable. You know, he often used parables because people could relate to things when he would use parables. He would often use about a, a farmer perhaps planting and the crops coming up and all these things they were very well familiar with. And so he would use parables, which was a uh, an earthly message with a, with a heavenly meaning to it. And so this is what he does in chapter 22. Now, if we were to read the previous chapter, then we would find that the scribes and the Pharisees and these religious leaders hated Jesus Christ. They were trying to trap him. They were trying to destroy him. They wanted to kill him and get him off the face of the earth. This is what we find happening. And so now our God in heaven is addressing these people, these religious people in that day. This is who... Uh, that he is addressing. So pick up with me, if you would, at Matthew chapter 22, beginning with verse 1. So now the Bible says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again. So that tells us that he's already spoken again. So he had spoken to them uh, by three other uh, parables actually before this. He said, And spake to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king. Now, that's God. That's who it's talking about there. This certain king is the God in heaven, which made a marriage for his son. And that son is none other than Jesus Christ. So we see the story here, the parable. There's God the Father, and then there's God the Son. Now look what he did. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, that they would not, and they would not come. The word went out. This wedding is getting ready to take place, and they were invited to come. And they wouldn't come. And again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed. In other words, everything was ready. He had everything grilled and cooked up and ready to go. 
and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But look what they did. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm and another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid them to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Let's pray. Father, we thank you now for your living word that you have given us. Thank you for this tremendous parable that you gave in that day to get your message across, and it's for us today as well. And Father, we know as we read this parable that it's one of the greatest parables that you've ever given because it tells us about life, about the period that we live in today, where there are many today who are still rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Father, I pray in these moments that we will just see what you would have to say to us and to, and to see if there's a decision that we need to make today that you're leading us to make that that decision will be made today. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. In this day, the, the religious leaders of this day, they were set out headstrong on killing Jesus Christ. So they come here today following him, trying to trap him in something that he would have to say, but Jesus was too smart for that. He was too clever for that, and so they couldn't trap him. And the reason they did not go ahead and, and, and grab him was is because a multitude of people had began following Jesus Christ, more and more people. They had heard his teachings. They had heard his preaching. Uh, they had seen him heal people. And so there was getting a great multitude, the Bible says, especially back in uh, chapter 21, a great multitude of people uh, were now following Jesus Christ. So these religious leaders who wanted to do away with him, they were now afraid because of the crowd. They were afraid what might happen to them. One day, King Edward uh, the Eighth uh, of England, he was concerned about the social conditions of his country and things weren't uh, real good. And so he wanted to help some people. So he got together a couple other people there and they went to the very slum area uh, of his city. And he went to the door and he knocked on this man's door. And the man did not answer the door, but he asked the question, who is out there? And he said, it's the king. I'm the king. I'm here to see you. Well, this guy who lived inside this uh, little rundown shack, he knew in his heart that the king was not going to come and see him, and so he would not answer the door, and he told him to go away. Did you know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, knocks on the hearts of many, many doors today, inviting people to come and know him in a personal way? But they're like this man in the slum area there who said no, that he wasn't about to open his door, did not believe it was the king, so why would the king come to his place? But yet because of his belief and his thoughts, then he rejected and he said no to the entrance. He turned him away basically in unbelief. He didn't believe that it was the king. There are many today in unbelief that will turn away Jesus Christ. Sadly, there are many Christians today who've accepted Christ as Lord and Savior of their life, but yet today they are playing games with God. Let me tell you, God does not play games. He's not a God who plays games, and, and it's serious to Him because there are people who are lost without Jesus. And those of us who claim to be Christians, we must be that influence upon them and share with them that they might come. As a matter of fact, the last verses we read there, He turned from going to the Jews. You know who He turned to? The Gentiles. The Jews hated the Gentiles, and Jesus because of the refusal of the Jewish people, then Jesus turned that message of the Gentile to all of us who are, we're either Jew or Gentile. And now we can know this Savior that we're talking about. So he gives, gives a, Jesus gives a, a rejection of the king's invitation is what we uh, see here. A king's invitation, think about that. There's not everybody gets to be invited to the king's uh, uh, wedding or the banquet. 
And so this is a king's invitation that goes out there. Look at verse number 8, if you would, because he illustrates how the Jews rejected the Christ. He said, Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not ready. They were not worthy to come. They were not prepared. Now, in those days, weddings are different than the days that we have. In days that we have weddings now, and I've, I've been a part of some beautiful weddings. Uh, uh, there's just, they're just wonderful occasions. And now we send out invitations to weddings, but we know the date of that wedding. Back in this day when they did weddings, the word would go out there that there was going to be a wedding. Now there was an engagement period of one year. From the time that you become engaged, there would be one year later uh, would, be the, would be the official wedding. In that meantime, the groom would be preparing a house, a place, in order to have his bride, and she would live with her parents for that one year period of time. Now, we've gotten now to where it's time for the wedding, and so he sends out his servants to remind these people that they've already invited that where the wedding is ready. It is time now to come, and they were to be ready on a moment's notice uh, to come and be a part of this. So he says there in verse 9, Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid them to come. Because these people rejected, he said, Go out and invite others. That's what we're to do. We're to go out now with the gospel message. Not, it's not just for the Jewish people. It's to the Gentile. It's for anyone who's willing to hear the message. Verse 11 said, And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. In that days they would wear garments. The, the uh, groom would provide garments for those people who would be a part of the wedding. And so here's a guy who shows up at this wedding and he doesn't have the wedding garment on. He doesn't have the garment that he should be wearing. So we just look at the verses there. We could go on and read the rest of this. Then he was cast out because he was a person who was, wasn't prepared to come uh, to that wedding. And so there was a national rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ in that day, but there was also a personal rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ as well. So there's a tragedy there's a tragedy of saying no to Jesus Christ in this gospel that he presents to us today. The gospel presented, we hear it on the radio, we see it on television, we see here many, many preachers that are delivering message from our pulpits, and the, and the invitation goes out. I'm a firm believer that every time that the gospel is presented, whether it's through song, through a testimony, or whatever is presented either way, or through the preaching of his word, there should be an invitation. People should be able to respond to the gospel That's because it's powerful. You know, the, just like we're reading these verses here, this is God's word from heaven to earth, to us, to read. And so there are powerful words that God has given us. And so there is a tragedy of saying no to Jesus Christ. And that is to be separated from ever and ever and ever from this God in heaven who loved us so much that he gave his son. Now look at verse number one. And we're going to see how these religious leaders of that day, how they, uh, how they were so determined that, that Jesus Christ would, uh, would be killed. That's what they want to do. So Jesus answered and spoke unto them again. He's already mentioned verse in chapter 21 by parables. And here's what he said. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king. Now a certain king is God the Father. So let's get this picture. When he talks about a certain king here that sent out this invitation, it's God the Father in heaven that he's talking about, okay? And so who is he talking about? He's talking about a marriage for his son. And so this certain son here is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. You get the picture now? God the Father, he's the one that's inviting people to come. There's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb one day, folks. You're either going to be there or you're not going to be there. One day, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and this is talking about the millennial period when Jesus Christ will set up his millennial thousand-year period upon this earth. Who's going to be there? All born-again believers, people who are prepared to meet Jesus Christ because one day, the Bible says he's going to come back. And we're either going to be ready or we're not going to be ready. We're going to be, we're going to be prepared for his coming or we're not going to be prepared for his coming. And so God was planning this wedding, and it's talking about Jesus Christ. So he's coming back for his bride. So who's the bride of Jesus Christ then? It's all of us who are born again, believers of God. Those of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are the bride of Christ. 
We're Christians now. We are born into the family of God, and he's going to come back one day for us. He's going to come back, set up a thousand-year millennial reign upon this earth. It's going to be a perfect time where the lamb will lay down with the lion, a place that we'll be able to enjoy the presence of, of the Lord Jesus Christ who sits on the throne of David. That's what it's going to be one day. And so if you have an invitation, and the invitation is, come unto me, all you that weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. He says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We can share that with people, share about heaven and a perfect place for all eternity, but yet there are those who still reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number three. He tells us number three about the custom in those days, a whole lot different from the weddings that we do today. As a matter of fact, I was, uh, yesterday I was, uh, I was uh, flipping through the TV uh, checking the weather and stuff, and, uh, and on one of the channels it was talking about the wedding uh, back in that day of Prince William and, uh, and Kate Middleton. And you know, it made the comment on there that they said that there was probably all together, after everything in other countries and all that watch it, there was probably close to a billion people who were able to see about that wedding. Now, isn't that amazing? There was about 40 million viewers, I think, actually, while it was going on. But they said when all was said and done, that about a, about a billion people would be viewing the wedding that they had there, which uh, uh, it lasted all day long on TV. You know, you saw all this stuff, and I watched a lot of it. Uh, they asked me to come do the wedding, but I was busy. I was planting a garden, and I wasn't able to go do that, and I hated not to, but I didn't go over there. Uh, and so the, the Westminster Abbey and all that stuff, a thousand-year-old church in London, I mean, it was big-time stuff. But let me tell you something. It is pale in comparison to what the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to be one day that our God in heaven has got for us. You can mark that down. Nothing compared to the beauty of what he has for us one day. So who's going to be there for that? For those of us who've received Jesus Christ into our heart and asked for forgiveness of sin. This is what he is telling us. So it is a, a royal wedding one day we're going to have for all eternity because Jesus Christ, as the Bible says, is coming back uh, for his bride, and we're all invited to be a part of that event. Let me ask you a question. What if he called you today? What if your life were to be over today? Would you be with him for all eternity? What if the Lord came back today? Would you be prepared for all eternity? Even if you are saved today, are there things in your life that you'd be ashamed when you stand before God? You see, God doesn't play games. This is serious business with Him because it's an eternity we're going to spend somewhere. You and I, a hundred years from today, we're either going to be with the Lord or we're going to be separated from the Lord for all eternity. One or the other. It's simple as that. That's what the Bible plainly teaches. and He makes it so easy for us to read that we either accept Him or we don't accept him. This is what Matthew had to say. Matthew said, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father. So we know, we know where it's going to be, but we don't know when it's going to be. And one day, he's going to come back. There are those now who are Bible scholars who say, You know, it's time now that we quit looking at all these signs. You know, there are many, many signs that point toward the end. And many of those things have been revealed. And a lot of stuff that's going on right now today in our world, I think is nothing but prophecy being fulfilled. And they say now that we can just really need to stop looking at the signs and listen for the call. We're that close to his coming again. I believe that uh, with all my heart. Matthew says, Therefore be you also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man is going to come. You know, there's going to be a lot of surprise people one day. Some people who are good people morally, they lived a, a, probably a pretty good life here. They treated everybody like they want to be treated, but they went through this life and they never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And you know, to think that they will never be with their family again, their loved ones who've gone on to heaven, never be with them again, never be able to fellowship with them, and we have an opportunity to sit down for a thousand years during the millennial reign, that's not even heaven. Heaven is after that, and then eternity be with them why would people not want that in their life? 
to know that their little boy is going to be in heaven and they're not going to be, or their little girl is going to be in heaven and they're not going to be because they've never received Christ or a mom and dad to know that that dad there is in heaven waiting on them to get there but yet they're down on this earth and, and they've not received Christ. You see, there'll be many people like that when Jesus comes back and they'll say, I was going to, you know, I, I just hadn't gotten around. I was going to do it. But now is our day of grace, folks. Now is the time of salvation. So he tells us there, for in such an hour as we think not that Jesus is going to come again. Matthew chapter 24. So it was an event in this day. So actually there's some summons to this wedding right here. It was announced that the wedding would take place and now this man has prepared the food. He's got everything ready and he sends these servants out and what do they do to the servants? They treat them horribly. So what's that in comparison to? That's in comparison. We have the prophets of the Old Testament. They went about telling about this God in heaven that there was a Messiah coming. Jesus was coming. You know what they did to the prophets in that day? Many of those, many of those prophets lived a, were lived a, had a horrible death because they were proclaiming there was a God, one true God. So God sent the prophets. That's what he's talking about. That's the servants who went out and asked people to come to this wedding. That's what in reference to. When you get to the New Testament, it's apostles. You read about the apostles, how that many of the disciples of Jesus Christ died, how they spent their last moments on this earth. They were willing to give their life for Jesus Christ that others might know him. And so this is what he's talking about when the, the servants went out to bring a message. And so some of them were slain there. They were treated horrible and their lives were taken. That's what's happened in our world today. Look at Paul and some of these other great men of God who literally gave their life. Missionaries who've come to this world and gone to take the gospel out and their lives have been lost because of that. This is what he's referring to when he talks about these people who were bidden to come and the servants went out to invite them. So we've been invited. And when these things began to come to pass, look up and lift up your head for your redemption draweth nigh. There's so many things that's happened in our world in the last few years. There's been more prophecy unfolded in the last 10 years than all the years put together before that. All the things that have happened is just pointing to nothing but Jesus Christ is coming again. Folks, he's coming. He said he was coming when he gathered his disciples together. In John chapter 14, he said, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. For who's that prepared for? It's for people who trust in Jesus Christ, who trusted him, who believed in him. And people say, yeah, I believe there's a God in heaven. I believe the devil believed that. He even knew that. But there's another thing to agree with him that, yes, we are sinners. I realize, God, I am. But we let pride get in our life, you know. Or what will other people think if I become a Christian now? Don't worry about what they think. Worry about what God thinks about you. You know, and then once you have Christ in your heart, your life has changed forever. Now you, now you see what living really is. This is what he is talking about here, that our redemption draws nigh. Look at verse number three. He said they would not come. So this invitation has gone out again. And so it's from the king of all people. I mean, that's royalty. You can know that, that he's going to give a, he'll give a banquet that's like none or a wedding that's like none before. But verse number three tells us they rejected these who went out. So I'm still amazed today that how we can tell people about the love of God, how much he loves us and gave his life for us and what he does in our life every day. Many Christians could get up in this room today and give a testimony of what God has done in your life, how he's blessed your life. But yet there are those who will reject this Jesus Christ and they're on their way to a devil's hell for all eternity. Queen Victoria one time visited a, a large paper mill there in her nation and she was taken back to a, what they call the rag room. And then when they went into that room, they warned her before they went in, there was nothing but filthy rags in there. I mean, just filthy rags. And they explained to her that there was a chemical that they could put these filthy rags through, and when they put them through this, it would make them beautifully white. And they would have paper products made from that, and it would be beautifully white. She couldn't comprehend all that, but that's what they told her that day. And a few weeks later, after her visit there, she received something in the mail one day uh, to the palace there, and it was some beautiful stationery. And on there they marked, this is what you saw in that room that day in the rag room, 
and this is a beautiful product that it is. You know, that's the way it is with Jesus Christ, is it not? We're robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, a robe from heaven, the perfect righteousness. Every sin you've ever committed, every ugly word you've ever uttered, every, every wrong that you've ever done in your life, think about that. We take that to the cross and we're forgiven at the cross. He forgives that forever for all eternity and writes our name down in heaven. Is your name written down? Is your name in the Lamb's book of life? It's either there or it's not there. It's either written down or it's not written down. So he gives us a beautiful robe, and one day we're going to stand in his righteousness. So he tells us again, verse number 4, another invitation there. Again, it goes out. And he said, I prepared my dinner. The meal was ready. All this stuff was done for the people to come. But yet they found other things to do. Second Peter chapter 3 tells us that the Lord... And I'm glad of this, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but as long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. It's God's will that you come to know him. It's not his will that you would perish. You see, you have a will. You can choose. You can either choose Jesus or not choose him. That's a choice that you have. You can either choose his way, but it's, he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. There are many people who say, well, how could there be a loving God, a gracious God, and that he would send anyone to hell for all eternity? Well, let me tell you, folks, he doesn't send anyone to hell. We choose. We make our own choice. If we do not accept him and what he's done for us at Calvary's cross, then we reject that, and that is where people find they're sending themselves to eternal separation from God's word. The Bible tells us that. But look what they did in verse number 5. All this stuff, the Bible says they just made light of it and just went, to their, went their own way. In other words, that word there, make light of, means in the Greek to neglect. They just neglected. They just neglected the king's, the king's request to come. There are many today who neglect the calling of Jesus Christ. They know they ought to do it. They have family members that are saved. They have a grandma and a grandpa, perhaps, uh, maybe a mom and dad or a brother and sister, someone, uh, or even a child. They have someone saved, but they neglect it. And they think, well, one of these days, one of these days I'll get around to doing that. If you and I could walk through the halls of hell today, we would find many people that had good intentions that one day they were going to get saved. Then all of a sudden, because of an, an accident of some kind, a car wreck or, or whatever might happen, their life was over. You see, they had good intentions. One day, one day I was going to do it. One day I was going to make that decision. But they put it off and put it off. They neglected it. That's what he says. They made light of it. That's what that word means. They neglected it, and one day it's eternally too late forever and ever. Verse 7, when the king heard that his invitation had been rejected, he was filled with rage. He was wroth, your Bible says right there. And what does that mean? That means that we have a God in heaven who's a loving God. Aren't you thankful for that? He's a, he's a long-suffering God. He's a loving God. But let me tell you something. If you read the Bible and you miss the wrath of God, then you've not read the Bible that I'm reading. Because God is a God of love, but God also is a God of anger. And you know what he said? He said, enough is enough. I'm afraid that's what he said perhaps saying perhaps to America today. We've turned our back on him. That's very obvious. All the things from where we started out as a nation, we've, we've neglected, we've turned away from. And I believe one day God's going to say, okay, if that's what you want, then that's what you can have. That's what he did to the children of Israel. Enough is enough. And so this is his wrath now. What did he do? Verse number 7, the city was burned up. And we know that from A.D. 70 when Titus came in and, and the city of Jerusalem was destroyed and all those Jewish people, all those people there were destroyed. That's God's wrath. You know, for God to be, a, uh, for the, God to be the holy God he is, then there has to be judgment. And there's a penalty for our sin. And so Jesus Christ came and paid that penalty for us. I think that's one of the most splendid truths in the Bible, that God is a God of love. But the Bible said also God is a God of wrath. But the Lord is a true God. He is a living God, an everlasting king. At his wrath the earth shall tremble, and the nations shall not be able to abide in his indignation. Folks, I believe it's all coming to a close. I really believe that with all my heart. 
So those who've rejected will be lost for all eternity. How sad that is. Adoniram Judson, who was a young man uh, at Brown University back many, 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 many years ago, he was raised up in a church probably like Poplar Grove Baptist Church, and he was taught the things of God, and he went off to college. And there was a man there in the college named Jacob Ames. He was a professor there, and Jacob Ames was an atheist. And many of these young men who came in there had young minds, you know, they, they, were, they were fresh out of high school, and, and he had put it in their mind that there's no God in heaven, there's no Jesus Christ, there was, he was just a, maybe a prophet. And this is what, and they loved this guy because he had a lot of charisma, but this is what he was teaching them, plus the classes that he was teaching them as well also. And so they, he made a tremendous impression on their life, and some of them, he's so confused that they didn't know what they believed. You know, they, they were brought up in a Christian home, and they were taught that Jesus loved them and come into this world and died for them, and, and now he's got all that stuff, he's got doubt put in their mind. And so Judson, Adoniram Judson, was very confused. After he got out of college and got away from all that, then he realized the error of his ways, and he realized how wrong that, uh, that Jacob Ames was and what he was trying to teach them. And so later on, he was traveling the country as a missionary, and, and he uh, was in a village, and uh, he asked uh, for room in that village that he could spend the night, and uh, they were full up. And they said, well, there's, there is, there's one room uh, that's available, but we have kind of left it open because the room next to it, there's someone who is basically dying, and there's people coming in and out and into his room, and so we just kind of left that room. And he said, well, that's okay. I'm wore out. He said, I, I, I'll be able to sleep because I'm so tired. And so he took that room, and when he got in there, he found out how wrong he was because he could hear the groanings of this man who was dying in the next room, and he could hear people's footsteps coming in and out as they would come in and, and tend to him and soothe him and, and talk with him. And he, sometimes he would be real loud and vocal in his pain and his agony that he was going through. And so finally in the wee hours of the morning, Judson was finally able to get a little sleep. And the next morning when he got down for breakfast and to pay his bill, he asked the innkeeper, he said, by the way, he said, uh, and the guy apologized for the man in the room. He said, by the way, uh, uh, how is he? And he said, well, that man uh, passed away uh, in the wee hours of this morning. And he said, well, I'm sorry to hear that. He said, was he a local guy? He said, yeah, he's a professor at one of the college here and said his name is Jacob Ames. And it just dawned on him there was his professor that he had in the school. And he said, he asked the guy, can I go back to that room just for a minute? And he went back to the room that he was in, and he sat down in that room, and he was thinking about that next room where Jacob Ames was. And he said, as he thought about that and, and, and how that this guy was an atheist, he thought that every groan that he would make would become a scream. Every groan that he would lift up, he would think in his mind, lost, lost, lost forever. And all these groans that he had heard during the wee hours of that morning was come back to his mind. And now when he heard those groans, he just, he just heard the lostness of it. Now because he knew who the man was that was in there and he knew that the man was an atheist, he didn't believe in God. And he said now in his mind, every, every groan that was made was one of that I was wrong, I was wrong, I was wrong, but it was eternally too late for him. He discovered he's wrong. You know, there's not going to be any unbelievers in hell because it's going to remind them that there was a God and that there was a heaven and there was a hell. So there'll be no unbelievers in hell. But he said he'll never forget the rest of his life as he sat there and thought of the screams that went out of that man's pain and stuff before he died. And he thought, he is dead. He's lost without God. Lost without any hope of eternity. And he said the screams went through his mind that the man would be saying, I was wrong, I was wrong. But you see, it's too late. So you see now, the Bible says, is the day of salvation. You know, you can say no to Jesus today if you don't know him. You, we, we have that right to do that. 
But it may be our last opportunity. We never know about life. I want you to bow your heads together for a moment. We're going to have a moment of invitation. Just as, just as Jane, Jacob Ames said no to Jesus Christ, one day Jesus Christ said no to him. You know, we can say no to Jesus now, but one day Jesus will say no to us. It's too late. There's no hope. You see, when this king in this story turned his wrath on those who would say no to his son, God's wrath turned on them. There's a God in heaven who loves you and his desire is to have a relationship with you, to know him in a personal way. And you say, I don't know how that I can do that. What do I do? If you've never received Christ as Lord and Savior, you say, yes, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, and I'm sorry. Please forgive me of my sin. You see, that removes the pride and all the stuff that keeps us from getting saved. The devil's going to say, you got plenty of time. You don't have to be in a hurry. You just take your time. Do it some other time. That's a lie right out of hell is where that's from. And there are many who have bought into that, and their life would be over, and then there's no, there's no hope. After this life, we're either prepared or unprepared. So what about you today? Are you prepared to meet Jesus? We don't know about life. We just don't know about life. The only thing that matters in this life is what we do with Jesus Christ. Do you have that promise that Jesus gives you that you'll see your mom and dad again one day in heaven? Do you have that promise that maybe you'll see that child again one day in heaven for all eternity? That's part of the promises we get when we come to Jesus. Why would not anyone want that promise, to claim that promise and see that loved one and be with that loved one for all eternity? That's the promise we have from God's Word. We do it one way. We come to the cross and admit to God we're sinners and we're sorry and ask for forgiveness. And you know what? When we ask that, Christ forgives every sin, every wrong, everything we've ever done. And gives us a new life in Him. Have you experienced that is my question today. Then if you have, are you living for Him? Are you that example perhaps at work or school or wherever you might be? Are you example, an example of those you're around who are perhaps lost without Jesus, that you are a Christian, that you're saved, and you want to see them know this same Jesus? Are you being that example? Maybe you need today to recommit your life anew because you're not all that God's called you to be. Maybe you're looking for a church home. I invite you on behalf of this church to be a part of the Bible-believing church. This is God's invitation to you. The invitation was rejected back during that day. Are you going to reject it or are you going to receive it? And that's up to you. It's a choice that you have. My prayer is that you'll receive this Jesus because if you say no to him now, He's going to say no to you one day when you stand before him. Father, I pray for these moments of invitation. I just pray that your will will be done in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to be here at the front. This is God's invitation, just as this is an invitation in Matthew 22. This is God's invitation to you today, if you've never received him, to come to him. If you have come to him, it's your invitation to, to begin living for him. Let him work his life out through your life. Would you stand with me, please, as we sing? You come on this first verse. Mean business with God. You come as we sing. Just as I am Would you come today? Would you come? The invitation is out. It's God's invitation to you. You come. Would you say yes to him?
What about it today? bow our head just for a moment. Head bowed and eyes closed. I hate to close an invitation when someone's on the verge of making a decision. Maybe that person is you today. You've never received Christ in your heart. You've never asked forgiveness. Why don't you get it settled today? There's a lot of people in this room that have stood exactly where you've stood and they've given their life to Christ and they would tell you that's the greatest thing they've ever done in this life because it's eternal. They know how you feel today and they rejoice with you as you come because they know that feeling when we are a burden lifted off of us that yes, I'm heaven bound now. I'm going to be with the Savior for all eternity and my loved ones. Would you come today? Just say yes to Him. Say yes to the invitation. more verse and our invitation will be over maybe this verse is just for you sir, ma'am, young person he tells you to come just like you are don't try to get stuff out of your life and then come because you can never do it on your own, he said you come to me and I'll help you get that stuff out of your life that's the kind of savior we have that's the king we have who loves us. Well, amen. You may look this way. Thank you for being here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we're certainly glad you've come to be a part of our worship time together. Look forward to seeing you at 6 o'clock tonight. Uh, we're going through the book of James together, a tremendous book, and so we invite you to come and be a part of that. So thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, choir, for blessing our hearts and the puppet ministry. Uh, some of you need to get your kid involved in that ministry. I'm thankful for that. Uh, so look forward to seeing you tonight. Chad, lead us as we go, would you? Uh -huh.